The playoffs continue. We're still in the loser's bracket, everybody, but now we're down to the final four teams. The Akatsuki are waiting in the grand final. The Saboteurs are waiting in the loser's bracket final. And now we have Team Ash against the Enjoyers. Another best of five series here at Meta Madness 8 with Forehead Junction being our first map of the series. Now, the Enjoyers have obviously been absolutely insane. The fact that they are in the top four right now is in and of itself a massive accomplishment and big shout out to them we had a lot of the teams that i expected to make it really far in the tournament getting dropped out raiders for example have been eliminated yesterday which was just insane and now we have team ash going up against the enjoyers the loser will take fourth place and the winner will go off against the saboteurs 22 heroes here are completely banned out so once again those heroes are totally unavailable for the entirety of the playoffs and in addition to that Every single hero that gets played in a series cannot be played again. So, let's see how this is going to work out for our two teams here. Can the Enjoyers go all the way? That's pretty much the question. I mean, honestly, that's really what we have to figure out right now. Team Ash is traditionally super aggressive. They like to brawl, they like to fight, they like to invade camps to go ham right from the early game. And I definitely want to see a little bit of action between them. So, yeah, let's see. Let's see what we can get here. Vikings are getting banned again. I mean, it's a huge map. And as discussed in previous games on Warhead Junction, one of the things here is really that you have to focus on the boss at the top a lot. Now, obviously, getting the objective, getting those warheads is really important too, especially since you can use them not only to push for a keep, to push for the core, but also to take the boss in the first place. Sylvanas getting picked mega early here. Not banned. Whoa. I mean, she is just an insane pick right now. So, I gotta say that Sylvanas as an early start, I believe she has lost only one game so far. One single game where she was chosen in the playoffs has been lost. Everything else where she was played, she won. And now that we're on Warhead Junction, of course, if you get, for example, the boss and you push with Sylvanas, you're gonna make that push so much more dangerous. Now, we got Uther and we got Falstad as a response on the side of Team Ash. And I want to shout out Renella here. Renella played, I believe it was yesterday, the series that I commentated together with Tim with Trixler. And it was insanity. I mean, absolute insanity. He single-handedly, I don't want to say he single-handedly won the game, but his performance in some of, on some of those maps that they played in that series was just absolutely stellar, and he really, really made it happen. So, we'll see what he can do today. Now he's playing Uther, unless they're swapping that into a main tank role. On the other side, we're getting more of a sniper combo now for the Polish team with Toronda and Varian, so a taunt into a quick hit from Toronda and potentially also, then of course, the Hunter does mark for other damage. Samuro gets banned out. Zeratul is removed. Now, if you want to play Falstad, then Zeratul is just absolutely poison. So not something that you want to deal with there. In addition to that, the next double pick though. How does the blue team react to this now? They basically know what the game plan is now that they see Varian and Tyrande. Jaina, by the way, was not banned out. She's been an absolute staple throughout all the games here in the playoffs, and she's in a great burst damage. So is Grey Mane. He gets picked off by Team Ash. And you can already see that with Stukov now being added as well, we are already looking at a situation in uh, which we're having a double support. Uther is going to act as the uh, main tank, and then on top of that, you got the birdie and you got Grey Mane to make the players there so yeah very nice start for them here and it's also one of the few double support plays that we are seeing in the playoffs we haven't seen as many as i expected Ragnar, Ross, and Zul. Not really stupid. Zul can obviously roam between the lanes and has the wave clear. And Ragnaros can, in addition to that, with Molten Core, stop the boss from being taken too. And that is pretty huge. This is not a dumb strategy for the Enjoyers. I like that. There's definitely a lot of thought that has gone into the composition and what they are trying to play here on Warhead Junction. Leaves us with our final pick. And what are we getting for Lopaka? It's Leo. Guys, the stage is set. Game number one in the playoffs. We got the Enjoyers against Team Ash.
Ash against the Enjoyers, Renella on Stukov for the blue team on Warhead Junction. We have Bishops on Falstad. Morenas is playing Leoric, Shizakit on Uther and Lopaka. Last but not least for the Russian-Ukrainian team with Greymane. Over on the right side of the map, we got Arion on Sylvanas, Lavakal on Toronto. Ether is playing Zul. We have Itrex playing Varian and Alvaros is playing Ragnar. Ragnaros. Ragnaros in game number one. That's also fairly interesting to me. We haven't seen Ragnaros nearly as much as I thought we would. We had him in a couple of games, but it was honestly not too insane. And to be also fair, Ragnaros didn't have the best track record so far. Well, <laughs> and as I say it, he dies immediately. Ragnaros is down. This is the fourth time in the playoffs that Ragnaros has been picked. He won two out of three matches thus far, so either he's going for a 50-50 with this one, or we're going to see him pull ahead with a much higher win rate, but let's let's say that at least the first minute of the game is not really in favor of the enjoyers. They're definitely getting a bit murdered on this. So now all the way up at the top, we already have Ether starting to clear the waves, starting to do his thing. When we're talking about the heroes that are currently played in this game, the one to really highlight is May. Uh, sorry, not May. <laughs> Sylvanas. May, I'm sure, is going to make an appearance later on, particularly if this goes more than three maps. But Sylvanas has so far in the playoffs played, been played seven times. She's played a ton. And she was involved in every single draft, either as a ban or as a pick. And, well, that just means that at this point, she is one of the most successful heroes and most played heroes in the playoffs. She has won every single game with the exception of one single map that happened yesterday. And we'll find out today if that record holds because I find it kind of surprising that a couple of teams are willing to give her up very early in these series. And in this one in particular, I didn't expect her to be picked in the first game already. I mean, normally as the matches continue, there comes like a weird map. Your opponent is trying to play a certain strategy and you're forced to ban out some heroes against that. But in this case, he just let this completely go. Now we're going to keep our eye on the boss at the top, of course, as the game continues. We're going to try and figure out what exactly is going to happen there. In the meantime, what we have is just Ragnaros attempting to push out the bot lane as much as possible, forcing bishops back already a bit, but in the middle they're getting attacked by three heroes of the blue team, and since this includes Greymane, they can do tons of damage on those uh, structures. One tower already destroyed, gate nearly taken out too. And we're gonna get the first Warheads announced in just a second. So it is Warhead time. Well, down to the bottom of the map, what we're getting is still Alvaro's making his thing. So he's coming in, pushes this out. Falstead is of course a little bit safer than he would be with Zeratul making it into the draft, but he was banned by the blue team. In the meantime, we're getting for Sylvanas possession. We have now slow burn and the engulfing flame as the blast wave gets heavily focused on by Ragnaros. And since they're starting to take camps, Falstead also <laughs> face checks the push down here and immediately gets chunked a bit by Alvarus, who was guarding a Taranda. One warhead already taken, and they can immediately use it here now, which is exactly what they do, but it might end up with Lavacal falling, and he does. The explosion is still through, so he could at least use the warhead. Ah, uh, but this is still bad. Oh, 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 bad news for Ragnaros. <laughs> he gets cocktailed and goes down. So, yep, cocktail gets used and takes him on. That's four kills to zero now. So Team Ash with lots and lots of aggression at the bottom of the map now. And damn, they are getting another kill, aren't they? Greymane, another cocktail. Uh, maybe. Oh, nicely done. Lopaka dancing around him and able to take Varian down with another cocktail kill. Really nice play. Now Leo at the top gets also destroyed and now Falsett is coming in, but they were already starting to go for the wall and they took down parts of the fort. But the attacks that we're seeing here are pretty massive, even forcing at the bottom of the map the Molten Core from Ragnaros. And Greyman is obviously just going ham. He's just going for the throat there time and time again with really sweet plays that he's currently executing. 
Now that camp is about to be attacked, but this time it's actually the blue team that is trying to steal it away. So it has to be defended, but Sylvanas falls. Can they get a kill here? The double support that we're seeing for Team Ash is doing wonders with their sustain. They make a play for Zul, take him down, and they kill Varian, and they walk away from it. It's the entire five-man that is invading here. They're coming in with every single hero that they have and just ruthlessly take down three and steal the camp of the red team. The enjoyers, they're not enjoying this uh, all that much. I can tell you that because at this point, it's eight kills to one. We have them destroying one structure after another as they're starting to come in again. And I think it's only a matter of time until they're also making a play for Boston. With level 10 around the corner, they're already moving straight for it. Now, the first boss usually doesn't end the game, but with boss number two or boss number three, you can definitely make a move for the core. In this case, though, they have heroic abilities too. So not only will they get the boss, but very likely they're going to be able to not only destroy the fort, but maybe even push it further, always assuming that they will have the uh, heroic ability advantage over their opponent. So this is big. This is really big for Team Ash. Team Ash is coming in with some big plays here. And since they also were able to take Sylvanas out, that matters even more. So they're already getting ready for the push. Down at the bottom of the map, at least some camps have been taken for the red team. In my opinion, Alvarus is needed at the top. I don't think he has the cooldown back yet for his Molten Core. But they should try and defend at least the keep. And oh my god, this is going from bad to worse. No! It trucks! He gets away. Yeah, they gusted. We're trying to isolate them further. Now level 10 abilities are in. Thanks to Zul and Ragnaros who were pushing the side lanes. We got Lava Wave. So now they have something that they can also use to push these lanes out. And Lava Wave on this map is honestly not a bad choice. I mean, on the one hand, I'm really looking at this thinking, hey, it's Varian with Torn, Sylvan uh, Sylvanas for Wailing Arrow. Turanda for the stun, so if you go Sulfuras, you can just go smashy smash smash and just immediately cru yeah, crush them, but Lava Wave allows you to defend against the next boss a bit better, it allows you to take some of these minions out, so for map control on such a big map, it might be a good option, but of course they're struggling a lot now. It's level 12 and a half is level 11 and more and more of these warheads are now getting claimed. The top fort has already been annihilated, and now they are starting to come in here in the middle with the attempt to take another fort apart. So, yeah. Lava Wave at the bottom of the map, at least, is gonna get quite a bit of value. Takes one minion wave out, takes two minion waves out, and after they take Zul, might even be able... Is the spawn happening? Yep, gets the third as well. So maximum value from Ragnaros on this. <laughs> the problem is that the blue team doesn't give a shit. <laughs> they're, they're just jumping in. And they're just like, yeah, minions, no minions, we don't care. We're just going to go for the fort and we're going to try and uh, take it on. As soon as the rotations come, they have to fall back, but they nearly killed the entire thing. But Ragnaros got good value. I think he got three waves with uh, his lava wave. Three minion waves. So yeah, good on him. Uh, Wailing Arrow, Divine Shield had to be used. Oh, and now Sylvanas is dead. Nice job by Uther. If not for his Divine Shield, Falsa would have fallen, but now obviously they are getting farmed. That is Tyrandagon. And Team Ash goes through the Enjoyers like hot butter through cheese. They're melting them away, one hero at a time. Ragnaros is alive for a bit longer, but not for much. I mean, they're just burning the Molten Core down. They just don't care. Here comes the stun. She's a kid, barely alive, but he lives. It would be funny if the minions take him down. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not happening either. So now it's all about Varian, who's still trying to escape here. Alles rennet, rettet, flüchtet. Tag hell ist die Nacht erlichtet. To put a little bit of culture into this. But yeah, so 16 kills to 2. At least they were able to take Uther down, but you can already see where this is going. I mean, they're all just running away, trying to hide, <laughs> trying to escape the carnage that is Team Ash. It's getting ridiculous. The blue team is making this look like a quick match at this point, honestly. So, yeah, it's a bit bonkers. A two-level advantage now for Team Ash, and they're absolutely crushing it. We got 30,000 damage from Greymane alone. Sylvanas has only 20,000 that she can bring to the table. 
And all the way up at the top, what we're seeing in the meantime is at least one camp that is being set on route by Arian and his boys. The boss is on a one minute timer right now, and I can already more or less guarantee that once level 16 is ready for the blue team, they're gonna go for it. And will then try to go for keep and maybe even more. So yeah, we'll see. But at that point, warheads are getting deployed again. This time it's only two on the map they can rely upon. And the red team, they gotta wake up. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. They really have to wake up a little bit. I'm not quite sure what they were doing yesterday after they made it into the top four. Maybe they were just like dancing and partying it up. And I have still a bit of a hangover, but whatever it is, they better cure it quickly because whew, they are about to get their butts kicked. And then they have to try and recover game number two. Unless, of course, they bring this back somehow. They are trying. They are looking for a kill on Uther. They can't get it. The double support with all of the sustain that the blue team has is just a little bit too much for them. There's the Ghast. Ragnaros gets wrecked, but Falstead gets murdered too. As Sylvanas just says, nope, not today. Comes in, takes the birdie apart, and the fight isn't over yet. Zul falls too. They take Leoric down. So even against an opponent that has level 16 talents, they are still able to get some damage in. I mean, honestly, that fight could have gone so much worse. It's two to three kills, but given the fact that they are up against an opponent with a talent advantage, that's... Uh, I don't want to say it's okay, but it was definitely a lot better than I expected initially. So, top side still gets attacked here. Next minion wave comes in. Leo is starting to ghost over. If not for him, that fort will take some decent damage. And down at the bottom of the map, they're also trying to defend here. But of course, there's a couple of warheads on the map. Shizakid has already locked one in for himself. The owl comes a bit too late for an interrupt. And Morenas is doing the same thing at the top lane. And we still have that boss. That boss is still there, and honestly, it might be the salvation for the Enjoyers. If the Enjoyers are able to go and take the boss at the top and push with it, then it could be a completely different story. So once again, one wave is already taken out. As the lava wave is moving through, we're gonna have the next one uh, destroyed here. And I think the timing is not really working out for a third. But yeah, two waves already, so not too shabby. And up at the top, Boss is getting attacked now, and I think that the red team is missing this completely. Now, they will have to use Ragnaros in order to defend. So they now know that the boss is about to be taken. They won't be able to help it, but they can go for the fort here, and then they all have to hearth back. They gotta go back, and they gotta go back quickly, and then they need Ragnaros and his Molten Core to defend, because this push is gonna hurt. It's gonna really, really hurt them. Particularly since this wall is already falling, and yep! Here are the foreheads. So, boom. That drops it low. Alvaros is coming in. And it's party time. Can they at least get a quick kill? Oh, maybe. Not quite. Leo made it out. But yeah, defending this is not going to be easy in the slightest. Boss is already there. That bad boy is hitting and it's hitting hard. 16 versus 16. They're going to lose the keep. The question is, are they going to lose the game? Second boss oftentimes ends the game on 4 at junction. Greyman is coming in for the kills again. They take Sylvanas down. They drop Zul. They drop him where they stand with Ragnaros falling as well. The hopes of the Enjoyers are dwindling. And now that the core is getting attacked, Greyman Yes, he might have fallen, but it doesn't change the outcome any longer. As per our usual agreement, the boss and the second boss ends the game, comes in, they take down the core, and that is a lead in this best of five series in the losers bracket of the playoffs for Team Ash. Nicely done, GG. Well played. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Caldo TV. Game number two is going to take place on Battlefield of Eternity as the Enjoyers were a bit spanked on uh, the first map. A rumor has it that they needed a quick break to go to the pharmacy and apply a lot of aloe vera right now to all those burns they received in game number one. <laughs> But yeah, so let's see what actually they can do here. That was definitely a bit of a wonky game for them. We have now 32 heroes that are banned, the 10 that were played in game number one, the 22 that are banned for the entire playoffs. So let's see what Team Ash can do here. Is it going to be a quick 2-0 lead for them? Or are the Enjoyers now finally awake and uh, show us what they're really made of? 
they've always been one of the more scrappy teams and it always felt like when a series continued they were getting stronger uh, I mean, again, they're called the Storm League Enjoyers, so the more that it resembles a quick match or Storm League, the better for them, I suppose. We have Oriel getting banned out. I want to say that's the first. Not a lot of Oriel bans that we're getting, especially in the 1-2 rotation. So, uh, if you're banning Oriel, is that a soft ban on Chogal? There's a lot of discrimination going on, by the way. I just want to point this out real quickly. Chogal was banned... Actually, Cho was banned four times. You know how many times Gal was banned? Zero. Not once. People are only banning Cho. I think there's some real discrimination going on and we have to address it. We have to speak out and yes, I think that Cho has to speak his truth and make people aware of the plight that he has and of all of the problems that come with it because this is just not okay if you are just like hated and then you know you have like gal and he doesn't even get a single ban that's just not that's not okay that's not cool we need to start a hashtag we need to uh, get a survey going or something like that i mean it is absolutely it's 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 oh, it's unbearable unbearable i tell you so yeah cho banned four times gal not even banned once everybody likes gal everybody hates cho Zarya talking about hating things. They hate her too, apparently. And Alarak got banned. I find some of those bans very interesting. And it is very clear that as the tournament progresses and as the playoffs progress, we now have teams looking more and more not only towards the meta bans, if you so want, but more towards, hey, what does my opponent like to play? What are the preferences that they have? So, yeah, with that, we have now... ETC as a first pick for Shizai Kid. Again, you can play him in the main tank, you can play him in the side laner. Both is totally fine. Deckard Kane and Mei are in. Mei is actually also one of the highly successful heroes in the playoffs. I think she lost only a single map so far. So Mei and Silvana. Silvana has now lost a second map. But they are definitely two of the heroes that have an absolutely fantastic track record. And are insanely powerful there. So uh, we'll see if this is going to be another one where the enjoyers are pulling ahead a bit or if they're going to have trouble. But yeah, Bishops comes in with Thrall and we get Lunara too. So with Thrall, the usual question, are we going to see him in the foreman? Are we going to see him in uh, the side lane, trolling thunder, trash lightning? What's going to be uh, the choice? I believe that Bishops actually played already trash lightning a couple of times and got pretty good damage out too. So. Another chance for him to showcase the skills there. And Bambi, with all of the assets that she's dropping, can easily start to take down the Immortal. We still have Jimmy for Immortal damage. You could go Nazebo. We've seen that now a few times, and Nazebo was chosen for that. Of course, there's Artanis if you want to go for Amateur Opponent and add that to the mix. Greyman has been played, so it can't be played again. But there's still a couple of tools that you have available if you're really trying to go for uh, some uh, quick Immortal damage. So... Since we don't have any damage dealers for the enjoyers yet, this is their opportunity. A lot of CC already. You got May, you got Deckard Kane. But they still need to drop some damage on this. And by the way, Jaina is also still up. I mentioned in game number one already. Here comes Tychus, and we get the panda. Chen is in the house. And he's also fantastic here. ETC was, by the way, always one of the strong heroes, one of the strong tanks on Battlefield, simply because he can very well work around the uh, um, the stun circles of the Immortal. And we might see that again right now. You can slide over an opponent, stun them into an Immortal stun, push them into an Immortal stun, and all of that. So, yeah. Malfurion in the house for Renella, and there's Atanas. So Atanas very likely with the amateur opponent here. This, by the way, means that Thrall, if you wanted to, could be part of the four-man with Trash Lightning for stacks. Or, of course, you can still go Trolling Thunder. We've seen both now plenty of times. And uh, Enjoyers, they still need a little bit more mortal damage. And they go Deathwing, another pretty good hero with a nice track record so far. So yes, Battlefield of Eternity, map number two. Team Ash is in the lead. Let's see if the Enjoyers can bring it back. Ash is in the lead, the blue team with Renella on Malfurion. We got Thrall played by Bishops, Morenas and Lunara. 
Shizza Kid with ETC and Lopaka is playing Artenis. On the right side of the map, the Enjoyers. Arian is playing Tychus. We got Alvaros on Deathwing. Little fun stat about Deathwing. Deathwing has been played five times in the playoffs so far, and he has won every single game. So he's currently sitting at 100% win rate. Ether is playing Chen. We got Itrax on Mei, and we got Lavakal on Deckard Kane. So let's check this out and see what they can do. Who's going to take it at this point? Is Deathwing maintaining his stellar record? Or is the blue team pulling ahead with a 2-0 lead? I mean, time to find out. Deathwing on level 1 already with a molten blood here. I talked a bit about tanks too. And May is another good example of a really good track record at the front line. She has only lost a single map so far. She was played 6 times in the playoffs. And has only lost one map. So... We got Chen with the freshest ingredients, as usual, and if you take a look here, we have Protector of Aya again for Artanis. Honestly, I had this conversation with Team yesterday, I really wish they would make this a bit more impactful and would make their talent a bit more powerful. Artanis has actually won a game yesterday with it, he was absolutely useless for, I feel, 90% of the game. And then towards the end, he finally had enough stacks that he could bring some damage in and started to really help out. But I, yeah, I don't know. It, I would love if eventually we would get something, at least a small balance patch. Nothing insane, you know, where you see these massive heroes reworks or something. But if Blizzard would just tweak a couple of stats on some of the heroes or some of the talents, I think some of the... Uh, the heroes that are having a mediocre win rate or maybe builds that are not being played whatsoever could be revitalized a little bit reinvented just made a bit more popular by simply tweaking the numbers i hated it when blizzard came in and you know and thought always like no we have to go for rework it's like now do first you just have to tweak the numbers a little bit to make other builds more attractive and then you will see more diverse builds and different playstyles emerge as long as you just like tweak small and don't overshoot like crazy all the time so yeah Thrall goes down, and well, that is first blood. So, nicely done. Actually, it's not first blood, it's the second kill. <laughs> My bad. So, yeah. They got first blood twice. That's how good they are, you know? So, we have two kills to zero. The red team definitely having a better start into game number two than they had on the first one. Question is always, how far can they go with it? But, yeah, we'll see. For now, at least, uh, they should feel pretty pretty happy that <laughs> it's not starting off with a massive disaster again so yeah there it is but all right so we get the camps taken obviously shaman camps you always want to time it around the objective the whole idea is that while everybody is fighting for the immortal there's shaman camps pushing the lane and then your opponent will have to make a choice do they just go for the objective and let the camp do its damage on the lane against the fort or do they defend and therefore move away from the objective and might give you an easier time there. We are now at the bottom of the map. Yeah, Bishops still threatening Deathwing a little bit. And everybody else is fighting for immortal number one, particularly Atanas gets attacked and Lopaka is jumping out there. Tyke is also just firing away. And Thrall is running immediately into him. Tigers, by the way, with the bigger they are. So no stacking from Arian. We had a multitude of... Oh, wow. They are going for bishops. And they get the kill. Yeah, Thrall is getting a little bit farmed over here, isn't he? That's the second kill against him. ETC died previously. Pulled a bit of a lauber there. But now it's three kills to zero. And that is kind of rough for the blue team. They looked insane in game number one. But now the enjoyers on the second game have taken a significant lead in kills. They are dominating this a bit. If they can follow up with the first immortal, that would be a great start into the second match. Oh, but a nice swap against Mei. Yes, they get ETC, but Mei dies too. Now they're trying to make a move for Malfurion. And I guess he is going to fall to this eventually, isn't he? Where's that grenade when you need it? There it is. And that is the end. Malfurion is gone. Five kills to one. This is working out way better for the red team than uh, it did previously. Game number one, they definitely have to shrug this off. They got to focus on uh, game number two now. And they have the early level seven talent. That's already pretty neat. 
It's by the way funny to me that we have level 7 talents already in and the immortal hasn't been taken. Usually you see exactly the opposite. <laughs> you see the immortal is claimed and then slowly a team is making their way into level 7. So yeah, here very different. This immortal might last for a while. Both teams have level 7 abilities right now and they're starting to go for it once again. Atan is obviously with more and more hits coming in. He's sitting at 64 stacks now on level 1. We're going to keep a close eye on that. But that's definitely not enough to really have an impact on his damage numbers. But as the game continues, that can quickly change. Still no halftime show. Not even the halftime show has a hit. So Lopaka at the top has to hold off against Chen. Camps have all been defeated and there's still minion waves that are pushing in. We're also looking, of course, towards the level 4 talent for bishops. He has three stacks currently on the Frostwolf pack and is hoping to complete that too. But the entire situation has slowed down a little bit as the teams are going into more of a stalemate position. It's, yeah, again, the range damage that is coming in from some of them. Deathwing, the grenade from Tychus, they're just poking with everything that they have. The problem is really Bambi at this point. She's coming in with one hit after another and connecting these auto attacks. So as she gets to the immortal like she does here, then that's an issue. And they are actually winning the halftime show thanks to her. So Morenas is doing well. Oh, but Atanas gets caught at the top and is doing what he does best. He's dying. So yep, Atanas is gone. But now they're in full defense mode again. Six kills to one. It's insane to me, honestly, that with that big of a difference in kills, the red team has not been able to win this immortal and might actually lose it. So they're getting kills and kills and kills. They get a bit farther ahead in experience. But it's really the blue team that is threatening the immortal more so than they do. Tychus is trying to change that now and he might be able to pull it off. But now Thrall also completing his quest. The damage is coming in once again. It tracks. In trouble. The root the hit. May is about to go down. Gets a heal. Gets two. Potions galore. Then somehow makes it. They try for the immortal and they actually win it. <laughs> Oh my god, I have no idea how May survived this. Deckard Kane was just producing potion after potion. Man was sitting there just throwing them out, just like that. Drink them all, drink them all. He was like Oprah for a moment. You got a potion, you got a potion. Everybody <laughs> gets a potion. Yeah, and they all gave them to May, so she survived, which was kind of wild. But here comes level 10. Immortal is nearly defeated but they can push in with heroic abilities now. And, well, that's the Wandering Keg. That's the Avalanche. And we got the Stir a while and get wrecked from Deckard Kane. Easy fort, obviously, when you have level 10 abilities and an Immortal. And that big of a lead in kills. And, uh, well, there we go. Top side, Chen. And uh, Tannis, all right, trying to work in a couple more auto attacks here. And here are the heroics on the other side. Sundering is immediately getting used. Bishops with a flank. They're trying to go for the back line. Tychus gets swapped and is in trouble. Tychus gone. They go for the <laughs> ETC and he falls to the towers. But it seems that this time Itrax isn't making it. Yeah, Deckard Kane did his best to keep him alive. Lopaka, on the other hand, he swapped himself <laughs> into an early death. So, yeah, a bit unfortunate for Atanis here, I suppose. <laughs> Atanis just doing Atanis things. This, this is pretty much what's happening there. So, yeah, came in for the swap, and then he's like, nah, yeah. <laughs> and he died, too. Now, they got May. I gotta give him that. They traded kills, so at least that's the thing that happened. But now we have 8 kills to 3, one fort is destroyed, everything else is still on the map. And now obviously down at the bottom, the steal from Deathwing. Alvaros is just doing a stellar job here. And again, I I've talked about it before, I'm saying it again. Deathwing is so far undefeated in the playoffs. That is not the biggest sample size, don't get me wrong. He was played 5 times, but given the fact that you can only play a hero once within a series, that already means that he has been played... I mean, not every match, but quite a lot. And having a 100% win rate there is still noticeable. Now we have another camp up for grabs. Immortal is now up on the map too, so they can already start off with an early lead here. And that's exactly what they're doing. Chen gets caught then again, so the blue team is currently 
in a bit of a better position thanks to their numbers advantage on the map. Tannis is coming in, looking at a couple of hits here, looking for a swap that he doesn't get either. They're going for Deckard Kane, and oh, May with a big play. That was huge. Intrax with a fantastic snowball. That was nice position from him. Lavakal got saved. I mean, barely, but they were able to keep Deckard Kane alive, and that's all that matters at the end of the day. Now they got a level 13 talent advantage and Chen back up on the map. It's about as good as it gets here, and they're immediately going for the Immortal, and you can tell that the blue team isn't even thinking about going for a proper defense. They're just hoping to get level 13 talents. Thrall has already fallen low too, so now they're starting to kick Chen out a little bit. Uh, sorry, kick Artanis out. Comes in with his ult, but Lopaka gets wrecked. Deckard Kane going for the full sleeper setup as he is putting Artanis to the test, and now they're going for ETC again. You gotta give it to the enjoyers. They are looking so much better than in game number one now. And they're able to pick up kill after kill. It's 10 kills to 4 now. And they are looking awesome. That's a completely different team all of a sudden. Yes, their opponents, they might now have level 13 talents. But it doesn't change the fact that we're looking at a red team that is picking up massive amounts of momentum. And clearly want to go for a tie in this series as we're headed into game number three. They don't want to have to pull off a reverse sweep here. So, yeah. The attacks still keep coming. Thrall looking for a good angle to get Sundering through and section someone off here, driving a little bit of a wedge between them. Parting the opponent team like Moses part of the sea. And they go for Lopaka too. Once again, Atanis with his ult. And here comes Odin, baby! Just as we see the mosh pit. It's a mosh pit baby, but no kill, and May is sliding out, and now Deckard Kane again with a big play. They go for Bishops, body blocks are in, and Thrall goes down. Thrall is eliminated, the Panda's in trouble too, he dies as well, ETC is suffering, and there's beef on the table tonight, isn't there? At least they want him. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Deathwing, the heal, and he'll survive. Four versus four, but it's the blue team that is now trying to go for the immortal. I mean, damn, they're really fighting tooth and nail here to make that happen. And Lunara in particular is doing so much work. Bambi jumping in, jumping out. They're trying for Tigers. Deathwing with a superhero landing as they're trying for another kill. Look at Lord Tannis is. He's about to fall. Arian though, super low too. Gets a heal. <laughs> and gets killed, as does Artanis. <laughs> Insane. These fights are bananas. Thrall is thundering back in just a second. Wow. Just wow. Great plays here by, I mean, so many of these guys. You look over to Deathwing, he's at 38,000 damage. He and Deckard Kane both haven't died yet. Neither has Lunara, so Morena's has still zero deaths. And as they are still continuing to poke against the Immortal, the attacks are coming from the top once more. Thrall again has Sundering and could use it. Deathwing with a stun attempt that backfires. Here comes the keg and the barbecue. May is alive, potions everywhere, but they're going to commit to the Immortal now. And it seems like the blue team... Oh, the blue team was about to take it. And then May again with another sick snowball. These ults from Itrax have been a blast to watch. One saved Deckard Kane. now he went for the triple and just barreled them out of the fight. They're giving up on the Immortal anyways, but that was a super sweet move that we got from them. The Enjoyers are gonna lose the Immortal. But they have a leading experience by one level, and now we'll see how well they can defend at the top lane. It's not a massive shield on the Immortal, but still. If they get level 16 for the defense, that would be great, but a little bit on a timer there. Chen is moving in and trying to make it happen now, but yeah, he's getting company. So if they're greeting too much, yeah, they're greeting for the experience now. He has the keg, so he should be able to use this. I mean, at this point, you just got to keg out. Right, I oh, <laughs> did not like this. <laughs> Top keg plays from Team Ash. But not good enough. Then again, Chen might still be in trouble. They are really committing to him. 
But Deathwing is giving some assistance at the bottom of the map. Top side, the Immortal has been defeated, so the fort is still standing here. Which means that essentially at the end of the day, Team Ash hasn't gotten a lot out of this. Still all of the forts there, unless they're getting a kill now, it means that this was a very successful defense. Now, Chen falls, but I'm not so sure. Can they get more? Oh, that Snowball did nothing. That Snowball did absolutely nothing, but they're killing Thrall. So Thrall is gone. Big barbecue play once again. And they're going for Lopaka as he's just swapping in out. And is trying his best with Artanis to wreak havoc here. Both teams now on level 16. So the extra talents have come in and provide Thrall with a synergy with his Alpha Wolf. So his level 4 and his level 16 are now synced up properly. Tranquility from Malfurion to keep everybody alive. As the fight happens again. May trouble and she goes down really good focus here from team ash as the blue team is slowly starting to take control of game number two now they're not quite there yet they still haven't destroyed a single structure but they are catching up in experience and are threatening to pull ahead here too so yep they are looking fairly good here looking really good honestly they struggled to find their way into this position, but now they are getting a lot more momentum. The next Immortal is spawning, and honestly, this one is going to be uh, super important. Whoever takes this Immortal is very likely going to make a big leap. Atanas now with 37,000 damage, still nothing to write home about. Thrall is ahead of him, and obviously Lunar with the 62,000 is way ahead of everyone in this game. But it's still not too bad. So as the game continues, now Tannis picks up a few more stacks on his level 1. He can start to become useful. So far he's been a damage sponge. That entire front line has suffered. All three of them have four deaths to their name already. Not that the red team is gonna fare, uh, is faring any better here. Three deaths on both Mei and uh, Chen. But this is going to be a big one here. It's going to be a real big one. So they go for Lopaka and, well, he's in trouble and is somehow still surviving, at least for now. They're trying to get the kill. What a snowball again from May! Straight into the tower range, into the fort range, and that's the end of Artanis. Artanis is dead. It's a 5 versus 4. They're even getting a stun on Thrall for a moment with Deathwing. They're hoping for a slow and to get more damage done. But this is the opportunity to go for the Immortal. And to defend the bottom fort, I guess. Because this one's also in trouble. So, yeah. That's a nice opportunity for them to now pull ahead. 14 kills to 6. It's an insanely close map. Particularly after the last one was a, such a statement from Team Ash. It's impressive to see how the Enjoyers are now coming back into the game here. Into the match. But can they kill? Yes, they can kill Malfurion. Malfurion is gone. That was huge. And now they're trying to go for ETC too. He's going for the party. Buys himself a little bit more time. And they still want him. And they're going to get him. So, goodbye. And they try Lunara next. But May... <laughs> May goes down too. So they're trading frontliners essentially. 16 kills, 2, 9. But it's a 4 versus 3 for now. So they have a numbers advantage. And they keep maintaining it. Yeah, Lopaka with more and more hits right now. Comes in again. Good sleeper move from Deckard Kane. They're trying to go for Bambi. <laughs> no, no chance. Oh dear. Lunara is down. She's eliminated. Here's Sundering. Chen is dead too. But they go again for Lopaka. And they're gonna get a kill. They're gonna get it. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> Uh, Deathwing is still able to make it out, but boy, the fights are all over the place right now. God, this game is a blast. They nearly have level 20. It's three on the map against two, but they are still, they're still not really in a great position for the objective. That's the funny part about it. So yeah, Mana is being topped off and they're re-engaging. Uh, this thing, I mean, the fights here, they just continue. It's bananas, honestly. Three versus four on the map now. And they're trying for the Immortal. So does Thrall. So we'll see who pulls ahead. But that's a level 20 in their hands. And now, and now it gets really dangerous. Now you got the big red button. You got stood in the fire. We got Purifying Brew, Flash Freeze, and Respect the Elderly. So a lot of those ults are still on cooldown. But if you are the blue team, you have to be super careful right now. If you can just delay things, that alone would be the dream. But if this Immortal gets taken with a decent shield for uh, t for the Enjoyers, then whew, you're in trouble and you know it. So yeah, they burn it down with some abilities and they're taking it. 
They're trying to reduce the shield over here, but this is still 50%, and that top lane is going to suffer. The fort will be destroyed 100%. The question is just what else can they do with it. So, well, here we go. We got the uh, Lunar Shower, the Intensifying Toxin. Thrall gets a bolt, and it's party time. Chen, very likely, is going to try and isolate someone here. They also have to be a bit careful. And look at Atanas. Atanas went into the Zealot Charge now. Zealot Charge and Titan Killer is what we're getting from him. So he should be able to get good damage out as more and more stacks are coming in. Yeah, the snowball kind of missing here, unfortunately, for them. But the fort gets destroyed immediately, and the goal is, of course, to at least take a keep here. So already they're starting to make a move. Again, the play for Artanis. He's in trouble. Pops his ult. Artanis has to drop out here. And Scorched Earth as Death Ring approaches. But he's all alone. All alone all of a sudden. They're trying to save him and they can't. Deathwing turns into Deadwing. The keep at the top is still getting attacked as the blue team is chasing. And everyone on the side of the Enjoyers is rushing away. I don't think this can be saved any longer. So yeah, they're going to lose the keep. But at least they're going to save the game for now. 51,000 damage by now for Artanis. He is still trailing behind Thrall and Lunara. But... They could have lost the game there, so this is actually not too bad. They could have lost that game. If they would have lost the hero instead of the red team, then I think they would have tried to go for the core with it. And the shield was nearly removed here. Just the fact alone that they lost now uh, uh, one keep at the top is already a lot. But yeah. Now, a couple more attacks are still coming here. 78,000 from Tychus with this big red button. One fort gets destroyed. <laughs> this is a wild game. We're 21 minutes in already, and we still have absolutely no idea who's going to take it here. The next team fight is going to be huge. And of course, that top lane is also a big problem because catapults are now going to hurt. We are 21 minutes into, 22 minutes into the game. So, yes, it's going to be problematic on the next objective if it is stalled out. If it is not just a immediate attack coming and some big aggression, then the top lane could become an issue, particularly since now the camp is taken too. So they have to camp here. Objective hasn't even been announced yet. Timing, you could always argue, could have been improved a bit there. But yeah, they're going again for Artanis, who is starting to focus more and more on Deathwing here. 18 kills to 11. Uh, now on the numbers. Tiger has to be super careful here. He's going to be a priority a target for them. So there are seven kills ahead and they want to keep it that way. Immortal is spawning in only 20 seconds and they're trying to defend the top lane at least for now. So they're focusing on this. Another camp at the top. If they're claiming it, then it would mean they have a bit of pressure relief topside. Those catapults wouldn't hit all that hard anymore because, yep, if they are just gathering up more and more of them, then that top lane is a problem. But I like that they're taking the camp at the appropriate time. The Immortal is already up, so they're missing a bit of time there, but it's definitely a, a worthy sacrifice. Just those few seconds that allow them to take the Shaman camp so that now the red team will have to deal with the bot lane too. May is already taking damage as everybody is ta going for a defensive posture there. And Atanas is trying to push the bot lane out in an attempt to put more and more pressure onto the bottom key. But that means that everybody is already moving in here. Morenas with Bambi is just getting more and more hits out. All that damage coming in from him right now. 328 stacks for Atanas, by the way, just as a bit of a side note. Deathwing looking for a good angle as he starts to move down to the bottom of the map in an attempt to take this one out too. Yeah, pops some of his abilities, but the attacks are still coming now. So they got to be super careful. The first one to lose a hero is going to have a tough time here. And on the Immortal, I mean, again, everybody's just looking for a decent angle. ETC in particular with Mosh Pit, if he lands a nice one, they could make the big play. If they find a target, they go for Mei. And she starts sliding out, but already the fight is starting up. And the old of Atanis gets popped as he starts to engaging again. They're starting to fall back here, yeah, and now on at the bottom of the map, this is still an issue. Deathwing starting to move in again, trying to take this out, and Tore burns it to a crisp. Has to deal with the catapult, but that of course triggered the attack at the top, and that is the end of Tychus. Tychus is gone, Deathwing is a bit too late to the party. Now they're going for Deckard Kane, and the old man goes down faster. 
then Biden a flight of stairs. So that is him eliminated. They lose Chen. The panda is gone. That's three heroes down. And that is Team Ash just absolutely crushing it in this team fight. They saw Deathwing at the bottom of the map. They immediately attacked and it is working exceptionally well for them. They have now a massive lead here and a big opportunity to go for victory. So they're starting for the keep and then immediately up for the core. They're looking for that 2-0. So the enjoyers have fought the entire game, but it looks like they're going to lose it here. Or do they? They take down Artanis, so he's gone. Artanis is at least eliminated, but they might not be able to save the core anyways. Bishop's also in a bit of trouble. Deathwing the Destroyer coming in, trying to save the day for them. It's five seconds until Tychus is back. Deathwing is trying to do what he can. But it's not looking good. The grenade! Oh, it's Bambi that wrecks the core way too fast. And that is the 2-0 lead for Team Ash. They take Battlefield of Eternity and the Destroyers. Uh, they, they, the Enjoyers are really in trouble now. Infernal Shrines, game number three, a 2 0 lead now for Team Ash. Now we gotta give it to the Destroyers, uh, the, the Enjoyers. I have no idea why I'm doing this. If they win this series, then they definitely have to be renamed into the Destroyers, but right now they're just enjoying themselves, allegedly, because they've lost two maps. But the point still being, they really improved from game number one to game number two. Now, if they can continue that trend, then they have a solid chance of winning Infernal Shrines, but Team Ash just seems to be on a roll here. So, as is, we have now 42 heroes pre-banned, 22 pre-banned for the entire event, and 20 have already been played. And Cho gets banned. It's always Cho that gets banned. It is discrimination. We don't stand for it. We have to start a hashtag. I personally suggest he too. Uh, and we have to do that in defense of Cho because it's just not okay. Nobody bans Gull. Everybody bans Cho. That is discrimination right in front of us every single time that we enter the Nexus. And we have to do something about it. Not cool. Not cool. Diaga gets banned as well. I have a feeling that he's going to be banned throughout the entire series. If this is going to be a win for the Enjoyers, then we're going to get another ban just like in the next in the next one of him as well. The Harker just becomes more powerful with every single game that continues because there's more heroes banned out. So, yeah. We get Arthurs. Yeah, they're actually working through the frontliners here. Banning one after another. Mm, what's the uh, what's the next one? Our starting pick. Actually, we're not there yet. Carrigan gets banned first. Yeah, we're on Infernal Shrine, so yes, ban Carrigan out. Bishops has been playing uh, Carrigan quite a bit, so that's a really nice ban. But here comes our first pick territory. It's actually kind of interesting that the Enjoyers decided to pick the map instead of first pick first ban. So yeah, let's see. What's the weapon of choice? Now that we're on Infernal. Sonya. Er, I mean, again, great pick here, don't get me wrong. Didn't expect her as first pick, but still, fairly solid choice. I think Marthael should make an appearance here. Should definitely go for him. Would be a great choice considering uh, what else is already banned because you got either played or pre banned, so there's a lot of that. Well, what is the red team now starting up with? I mean, Malthael, I think, is going to make an appearance, yeah. But outside of him, do we get some of those crazy picks? Alex Straza and Kelthas. I like that already, and it immediately... I immediately want to see Stitches as well. So Alex Straza can already create globes for Kelthas and his level 1, which is awesome. If they now pick Stitches as well, they can just go for a team that just thrives on globe stacks. I mean, just imagine it. They're now picking Stitches... And then they pick Raxa, and they just like pick up <laughs> globes all day, every day. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have too many heroes in the game that can just continuously pick up globes and uh, capitalize on them. Most of them have a cap, but at least picking stitches here would be funny. I would not put it past Team Ash though to ban stitches out. Now that they see that. I could also see Zeratul making uh, an appearance here, at least on the on the ban list. I mean, now you can play Zeratul, you have a chance to do that. So... 
And how is Jaina not bad, not played yet? I mean, seriously. How is Jaina not played yet? Am I brain farting? Has she been played and I missed it? It's kind of amazing to me. She's been making an earlier appearance in nearly every single series. And here she's mostly ignored. There's the Martha L ban. Again, I thought he would be picked, but they ban him out. So there's your chance to go Stitches. Stitches, like, go for the Globe Talons. Just delay the game for as long as you can. Get Kalathas the biggest shield, the biggest mana pool that you can possibly get. And Stitches a hit point pool that is just insane. Just make it happen. Okay, come on. This is your opportunity. You can, you can make yourself legends. Alex Straza, Stitches, just go for it. That is sad. That is such a sad move. I am personally disappointed. They can go for Tyrius level 1. Just saying. They could do it. Oriel and Gul'dan. Yeah, I like Gul'dan here. Oriel is also good. Tyrael with a bit of an adjustment. Go for the level 1. Ardent Restoration. Make it a thing. Ardent Restoration, Ether. You hear me, right? There's only one talent choice for Tyrael. Only one! Nothing else is allowed. But they need a bit more damage. Kalthas alone is not enough. So, final pick. Game number three. Match point number one. And they go for Mephisto. All right, guys. The stage is set. Off we go. We got our third map between the Enjoyers and Team Ash. Game 3, on the left, Team Ash with two kills, uh, two wins to zero. She's a kid on Malganis, we got Bishops on Imperius, Morenas on Gul'dan, Renella is playing Oriel, and Lopaka on Sonia. Come on, Atrex. Pick it. Do it. Atrex on Tyriel for the red team, for the enjoyers. We have Alvaros on Kelthas, Alex Straza played by Lavakal going into the circle of life. Ethers playing Diva. And Arian is playing Mephisto. And there it is. Art and restoration, baby! Give me all them stacks. Stack, stack, stacks. Globes galore. That's what we need to see here. So, get Alex Straza globes, complete the level one talent the rewards, the quests, and then just go and stack them up. All of them. Already a little bit of action happening here in the middle. First globe is in. Now there's a couple of camps that will pop up any moment, and then they just can start making their plays. Talking about making plays, Ether already gets caught on the rotation. It's a pretty dangerous frontline that Team Ash is running. They've been running triple frontlines for such a long time, basically every single qualifier, and even before Meta Madness. So they are really enjoying that heavy melee frontline that they are running right now. And there's a lot of stuns, there's a lot of CCs that they can use. Obviously, teams are now diving between the lanes and starting to collect some additional globes here as good for Tyriel it's particularly good for Alexstrasza and at the end of the day what they're trying to do of course is to get Alexstrasza stacked so that she can get and generate even more globes and that will benefit Tyriel and Kalthas a lot as those games continue so now an opportunity to get one after another. Alexstrasza is sitting at four. Kelsas missed out on one. And I love that Team Ash is attempting to interrupt the rotation as best as they can. So they are doing a stellar job just moving into the middle between the two lanes. But there's very safe rotations now happening from the Enjoyers as they realize what's going on. So, uh, yep, they are trying to slow that down a little bit. Some damage already done as Kalthas is again not being fooled here. But the blue team has now started to change their home a little bit. And instead is trying to steal these caps away. So there's more globes to be had. We're now sitting at six. They're missing out on the globes on the camps though. That is a bit annoying. But at least they're picking up everything over here. So another rotation straight into the middle. And yeah, they're still, they're, they're just going for globes. It's pretty much all that they're doing right now. Go for globes, try to take these camps out, prepare for the mid and the late game. <laughs> it even leads to Shizakit <laughs> trying to prep this up deep in enemy territory to slow them down further. 
so another globe has already been taken. They're attempting to deny it to them. They know, of course, fully well what the red team is trying to pull off here. So they're looking to interrupt it wherever possible. But Alexstrasza is now already sitting at eight globes. Kelthas has seven. And the speed with which they're doing this is pretty good. Now, it's not going to be ready for the first objective. This is also not where this is going to thrive. But it's still pretty cool that, the, that both of the teams are operating around this a little bit. The red team is going for easy and safe rotations in an attempt to accelerate the process. The blue team is trying to shut it down too. So, yeah, that's pretty sweet. I mean, Alexstrasza is already sitting at 10 globes, and uh, this is solid. She's going to get another set right here. If they can win, of course, the Punisher, that would be even better than they would get another two. But that's going to be tough against that front line. I think for them, it's really the late game where they have the bear, their best chance. Kalathos isn't even here right now. They shouldn't fight in the first place, and for some reason, they still do. So that's Alexstrasza falling early. Definitely not something that you can afford now. And here, they're still picking up as much as they can. Good move against Malganis, at least. Gets booped into tower range, nearly. Ooh, did the stun! And Tyriel is dead. Yeah, Tyriel gets dropped, and the first objective will, of course, now likely go over to Team Ash. Not only do they have the early level 7 talent, which is giving them a boost here, but they also have a big lead after they killed not only Alexstrasza, but also Tyriel. 10 stacks on Kalthas, 10 stacks on Alexstrasza. They still got to deal with it as best as they can now. So, yeah. I mean, again, bait over the wall, take it down as quickly as possible. Level 7 talents are ready for them now, so they're still burning this down as best as they can. They have to also try and get that globe that is currently over there. Tyriel is greeting for it. Gets it, but he's the only one. Nobody else was in range, and while well, he greets for the globe, Everybody is attacking him, so yeah, Kelthus is now down at the bottom of the map. Alexstrasza is sitting at 11. They take the Punisher out, and the red team is still heavily ahead, and they're going for D.Va. D.Va at the top is getting killed, and that's not the worst of it, because the problem is more that there's a camp now pushing straight for the fort, and there's a numbers advantage too, forcing Alexstrasza to go for the Dragon Queen, and Tyriel is dead regardless. Dragon Queen has been used, so the cooldown is on. Alexstrasza needs two more globes to complete her quest, and then she can give them even more. But it's already not looking that great. So Tyriel is going for a more aggressive variation of his build, of course, which normally also results in him picking Judgment. I'm not sure if they're going that far here. They might. Next attack is still happening. Another globe that they can get. They're nearly done with Alexstrasza. Taking Malganus out was a good step into the right direction too. Let's... Oh, that gravity lapse of death from Alvaroz. What a champ. Alvaroz, you fucking monster. What a boss move by him. Flanks in and hits it hard. Look at this. Comes in from the side and then he says like, you are mine. Hits both of them and they take them both out. Now they have level 10 abilities. That was big. That was huge. Alexstrasza now has her quest completed, so she is going to generate more and more globes for the team. This is going to help Tyriel, this is going to help also Kelthas, and they're, damn, they're going straight in for Shizaki. Okay, that's another kill. Team Ash is all of a sudden getting picked off here. They need to be really careful with that. I mean, really careful. This is four kills to four now. They had a magnificent early game lead. They put damage onto the fort in the middle at the bottom. They destroyed the one at the top. And now they're starting to be in a bit of a dangerous position where it might just turn against them because they're getting picked off one at a time. And you don't want to end up with staggered deaths here. Okay, ult by Tyriel. Heals are already there. There's the Horrify. And can they go for some of the Globes too? Yep, they can. Quest completed for Kalthas. That's big. Particularly considering the fight that they have in front of them right now. Nice attempt to take Uldan down. Good Aegis, but not good enough. He still dies. It's just delayed. And we have now 21 stacks for both Tyriel and also Kalthas. So yeah, both of them are doing exceptionally well with this. They nearly got the kid on Shiza kid too. So yeah, it's getting better and better for them. If they are able to get big globes as the game continues, not only is the survivability from Tyriel and Kelthas massively increased, but it's going to be a very interesting late game. We are only seven, minute in, minutes, uh, seven minutes in. Imagine this going to level 20 or something. That would be bonkers. That would be a little bit nuts. 
So yep, more globes, easy pickings here. And the fights, they're not over yet. 25 stacks already for Teriel. 25 stacks for him. Again, big re regeneration for him as this continues. We're still early in the game. They barely completed the level 1 quest. So now he gets another globe over here. He's still able to make it out. Gets the heal from Alexstrasza too. And they're coming in again. Nice. Good stuff. So, with that now, we're having a okay, <laughs> Malganus. They are farming Malganus here. The problem is that the objective is up on the map, and, well, Sonya at the top is going for it. They're not even rotating over because they realize it will be too late. What they're doing instead is making a quick play for the bottom four, and they're going to get this one. And Alex Straza, as they are all being kept together, is just giving them one globe after another one at a time here to get the early level 13. They can go for another one right here in the middle. Nice ult against Alex Straza. Horrifies a little bit too early for my liking. But let's see if they can still get the kill. Yep, Lavacal goes down. So that was well played by them. And a very nice job by particularly uh, Imperius, of course. Uh, Aurel gets also killed, though. The fight is not over yet. The problem for them is that Sonya isn't here. <laughs> That's the end of Imperius. There's Arcane Punisher at the top lane. They still have to defend this properly. It tracks with Tyrael is now sitting at 30 stacks. So yes, he has some decent regeneration himself already. And it just continues. But they gotta defend the top lane. I mean, again, they're gonna lose a lot of ground here. They are likely gonna lose both forts, since I would expect the blue team to now go for the fort in the middle and at the bottom of the map. So they're going for that quickly. 30 stacks on the globes by now. Shiza Kid gets attacked again, but is able to move out. Just taking a bit of a look on those heals right now, and also, of course, at the hero damage. We have 33,000, 34,000 for Mephisto. As expected, the rotation of the blue team has now hit the bot lane. Gul'dan is sitting at 32,000 himself. And while they are defending against the Punisher, we have Alvarus sitting in the middle trying to do the same thing here. He hasn't died yet. Has not died yet even once, so yeah party here continues as they're trying to also look for another hit 35 stacks already for imperial uh, sorry for Tyrael. again we're not even 10 minutes in just imagine where this is going to end up as we are heading into i don't know minute 25 or something like that that would be pretty insane now they're coming in again as sonia is starting to make her move but she gets quickly pushed back <laughs> I would love if just towards the end, you know, with massive amount of globes, Tyrael in particular becomes an incredible monster that will just destroy everything. He's getting his heal out there as well. Itrax gets attacked up at the top. Still going to be fairly okay here. And of course, he's taking a lot of pressure away from Alex Straza too, since he has a self-sustain right now that he's continuously using here. But yep, the party continues. Down at the bottom of the map, there's still a camp that they gotta deal with. Problem for the Barrett team is still that they're losing a lot of ground in structures. And of course, this is their last chance too. It's already an 0-2 in the best of five series. You lose this map, you're out of the tournament. Still a respectable fourth place if it ends up being that way. But of course, once that you are in the top four, you want more. They wanna go a lot further than that. 40 stacks already. Oh, they barely, they, oh, they were so close of seeing Sonya and being able to kill her here. Yeah, they still hope to get a kill maybe. Well, there's already a move made by bishops and the ult comes through too. But Tyrael should still be fine. A couple more globes are being hit out here. Yeah, Horrify gets used. Bunny hop and the Sanctification. Sanctification is in as they're trying to get a kill on Malganis. He's still fine for now, but there's the play for Kalthas, and he gets saved by Alex Straza. Gets saved for now, and they're making the next play for Gul'dan as they're trying to take the damage out in the backline. Topside gets attacked. The keep is now under pressure from the camp, and Sonya is still using her PhD in PvE as she's focusing on the bot lane. Nice double kill against the blue team now, but they are losing more and more ground up here at the top, and nobody is defending this yet. Instead, they're going for Malganis, but even with him falling, I would still call Worth because, yeah, this is tons of damage. Not only does the keep slowly fall here, but also Sonya is busy down at the bottom of the map and is doing her thing here. So they're losing way too much ground. Way too many important structures are being destroyed here as they are farming heroes on the other side. Obviously, it's nice that they're able to get these kills and take the fort down now, but at the same time, they're taking too much damage for my liking 
on important structures like the keep at the top. Imperial is now down at the bottom of the map. They're trying to assault the next keep. The shrine is active and they're looking for the early lead on this one, but it's it's getting a bit tough. 42,000 damage from Mephisto. Diva gets attacked at the bottom of the map and she's dead. Diva is gone. They can definitely get a massive lead now on this objective, but they... I, I don't know if they can even take this one. Tierra is now down at the bottom of the map. Itrax is obviously benefiting from all of the globes that he got earlier, but going up against Sonya is definitely no easy feat for him either. So yes, they are struggling. They're definitely struggling. Lopaka with good damage here. It tracks starting to move in, of course. Again, his damage output is at 32,000. They're giving up again a lot of points on the objective as another Punisher is in the cards for Team Ash. Blue team is going to lose Sonya now, finally. But what do they sacrifice for it? Not too much. Sonya is down. A couple more globes can easily be picked up. But of course, that Punisher is going to be claimed eventually. So yeah, it's a bit of a problem. They're doing well in team fights. they have more kills, but the issue is still the same. They're losing out on the macro game, and they're losing out on every single lane because of it. They've already... I mean, massive damage on the keep at the top. On the bottom of the map doesn't really look all that, uh, all that much better. So yeah, Itrax is diving in deep, of course, with the added self-sustain that he now has. He's trying his best here, but Globes are again only a bit of a sideshow for them. So another one is being taken here. 45 for Tyrael. They're looking strong on that. Again, you have a massive amount of mana and shield for Alvaros. You have Tyrael in good position, but that doesn't do anything for you if you're just losing, if you're losing the objective and eventually the team fights will follow. In this case, we now have the Dragon Queen again. They get a kill on Imperius at least, but just look at the minimap. Every single lane is pressured by camps now. Every single one of them. Every single lane is getting attacked by either a camp, by a Punisher, by multiple minion waves that are being stacked up on each other. Itrax, of course, is now just dancing around them a little bit, but he's overdoing it in my uh, my book. We have level 20 on the other hand. So now they get level 20, that gives us Mimic, the Ablative Armor. We have also the Ritual of Life and even the Seal of Eldruin. So Tyriel is already thinking about becoming a total monster and more of an assassin as the game continues. But they have to hold these lanes back. <laughs> and that's not going to be easy. I mean, the enjoyers are definitely enjoying themselves here. <laughs> that much is for certain. <laughs> and they get a kill on Gul'dan. They get another kill on Gul'dan. They're pressuring this more. Sonya is at the bottom of the map though. I cannot believe that they are not dealing with her more. She's been doing this the entire game, but apparently they're just looking at the bot lane keep and they're like, nah, we don't need that. We got two more. Uh, what's the keep on the f between friends, right? So instead they're going in the middle in an attempt to take their keep down, which they will be able to do. It's a five versus four after all, but that means that both of these teams are currently trading keeps. Now, they could go for Koa, and keep in mind, they have Sanctification on Tyriel. If they get now Bishops and they're about to take him down, then they have a chance to end the game here. 50 stacks for Imperial, uh, sorry, for Tyriel. But yep, Sonya's trying the same thing over here. <laughs> it's a race, baby! There's the Sanctification already! They should be able to win it, putting them to sleep, and it's a W for the Enjoyers. The globe strategy worked out, and well, that's a win. Garden of Terror, game number four. 52 heroes are banned and it's gonna get spicy as the enjoyers have finally put a point on the board. We had a little bit of a conversation going on in chat right now and I honestly can't believe it. There's some people apparently in my chat that hate coffee so much or don't like it that they don't even eat tiramisu. What is wrong with you that you don't eat tiramisu? It is one of the best desserts ever. It's amazing. If you would drown me in tiramisu, I would die happy. So, oh my god. I mean... The conversation pretty much happened because I said that I'm mixing my normal coffee blend beans with decaf beans to reduce the amount of caffeine that I have since I drink a lot of coffee, particularly in the morning. And I was thinking, nah, maybe not too healthy, reduce it a bit. And honestly, it still tastes good and I like it. 
but this whole thing that people have where they are addicted to coffee and if they are just not drinking it for a while they have i don't know headaches and withdrawal symptoms i tried that for a week or two and i had nothing it was just total normal i had no headaches i had nothing so we went straight back to caffeine i was like no nope, i'm fine but i was just trying it out as a bit of a not a gag but like an experiment so yeah but just imagine not eating tiramisu Oh my god. Like, we have a restaurant here. If you get a tiramisu, they give you the tiramisu and they have, like, some ice, like, whatever ice in, like, the ice that, like, foams and that has, like, it is so damn good. It's like, oh, not eating that. Oh my god. Horrible. The thought alone. Just a little bit of rum. Oh. The Haga is our first pick as Vanguard of Terror and the Vikings. Where do they end up this time? All right, it is Viking time. So we get Arthur's as well. And by the way, since people have been asking this, this is what a cup looks like. When I talk cup of coffee, this is a cup, okay? This is what I'm talking about. This is, by the way, the Heroes Gaming Community Cup, HGC. You might have heard of it. And if you want to check it out, there's a link to the shop in the description. Yes, we actually have a merch shop. You guys have been asking for one the entire time. Now you have one. Jaina, finally, thank you, finally. Jaina and Anna. So we get a nano booster Jaina. We get the Haka. Garden of Terror. Jaina, really good on the camp clear. And in addition to that, we have now both teams. Both teams are staying a bit frosty. I still use. I, I think you cannot go for a full frost team in Heroes of the Storm, right? We have Jaina. We have Kel'Thuzad. We have Arthurs. We have Mei. And that's it. Oh, come on! Banning the Butcher? Ah, okay, game over. We go to map number five. Death loss for Team Ash because they hate fun. No, that's not cool. And Choga get yeah, you're both you're both off a map now. It's unacceptable. And again, again, look at this. Hashtag he too. Hashtag he too. I'm telling you guys. They are always banning Cho. This is not okay. This is discrimination. They hate him. Gal, it's like I I it's not in, it's not okay. It's not okay. We need more love for Cho. Fuck Gal. Nobody likes Gal. Karazim and... Yeah, we got Phoenix. Also banned out. Uh, picked, sorry. So yeah, Karazim, Arthur... This is an interesting one, honestly, now that I look at it. We have Arthur's, Karazim, Phoenix. Abathur has been banned as well. Oh, that would have been an interesting one. On the other side, <laughs> I love game number four. Can I just say that? Game number four is always fun. Rexa and Alarak are in. And, well, our final pick. Come on. Final pick in the house. They're really hesitating on this way more than I expected them to. Maltael! Zarya was also up, right? They could have gone for a strong four man here, I suppose. But alright guys, let's go! Game number four. Let's see if we're going the distance today or if Team Ash is now locking in the victory here. Garden of Terror, our next map. The battle begins shortly, heroes. So, game number four. Let's go! On the left, we got Renella with Karazim. Bishops on Malthe, Lopaka with the Vikings. It is Viking time. And we got Morenas on Phoenix and Shizakit on Arthurs. To the right side of the map, the Enjoyers, everybody, with Lavakal on Ana. We have Itrax on Rexa, Arian on Alarak, Alvaros on Jaina, and Ether is playing Dehaka. All right. The Enjoyers are exactly where they want to be. They are thriving on chaos. They're in game number four right now. And those drafts are getting more and more chaotic by the minute. Honestly, for next meta madness, I expect the team that's called the Quick Match Boys. <laughs> but yeah, level one, we're getting Olaf the Stout. And also, we have the overwhelming power, so we're not going to get negatively charged here. I always like the uh, quest talents. They're always kind of fun in this case, but I'm probably not getting one here. But, yeah. It is party time. They already trapped Arthurs, and Shizakid is not getting out of this. Misha just came in, locked him down, and that is that. Well done. Quick kill, quick first blood. The Enjoyers with a bit of momentum here. 
Vikings are obviously now active on lanes already. The Haka is currently trying to see if he can maybe take one or two of them out. But the attack at the bottom of the map is focusing quickly on the first wall, and they're even getting a combo with Alarak off through the wall. Tower number one should fall in a second, though. Actually a bit surprised that they didn't go in with a bit more range damage in order to claim it, but now they're Siege Giants, and you always gotta go for the mercenary camps. So, yeah. Let's go. Up at the top, we got Malthael just sitting tight here. I mean, we got the Vikings, obviously, too, so it's all about just pushing the lanes out a bit. And they were hoping to invade the camp here, too. Nice combo, but they can't really go for Phoenix there, so, yep. I mean, as is, we now get also the Slumber Shells, so obviously the Sleep Double. Oh, ho, 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 that Howling Blast was neat. Good stacks for Arthas as well. He's going to be happy about that for sure. And, well, as the party continues, we're now getting the Debilitation Dart and a more damage against Morenas. I mean, Phoenix has to be very careful with this. He's been hit by multiple combos of Alarak already. The follow-up wasn't quite as good as it could have been in a lot of these instances, because if it was, we would have seen Morenas die at least once, maybe even twice. But, yeah, they are still continuing the pressure play at the bottom of the map as the Haka rotates between the mid and the top lane, tries to keep up with the Vikings, which in and of itself is obviously a big ask, but so far he's doing all right. They go for Arthas again, and they get him again. Arthas now down for the second time, but Alarak, unfortunately for him, gets also killed. Morena's had to warp out and is able to escape. Misha just following on his heels, trying to take him on, but yeah, they couldn't here. Yeah. Deaga then again, he's still moving along. We got Rexa now with the Hunter Gatherer. Obviously, Globe Talons are pretty good for the enjoyers as they've proven on Infernal Shrines. I absolutely love this, by the way. I would have loved it with Stitches maybe a bit more, but just Teriel being able to sit at 50 stacks this early in the game and then them going for core with it was super funny. It was very, very enjoyable there. So, yeah. Top side, what we get is Bishops just trying to push all of this out and making his plays there. We have, of course, with more camps on the map now, also the red team focusing on the next mercenary camp, so they're getting busy right here as they're taking down the bruisers. Down to the bot lane, the blue team has started to show up in force and uh, has still not gotten any damage onto that wall. First seed is also taking. I mean, generally speaking, honestly, outside of experience, where Team Ash has taken a lead, I want to say that the Enjoyers are in a pretty solid spot. Two kills to one, first seed already taken, and getting some structural damage in at the bottom of the map as well. Yeah, things could definitely go worse for them. I would not mind a five mapper here whatsoever. Team Ash, on the other hand, after winning the first and the second map, they're of course hoping to uh, bring back that momentum from earlier today and end this with a 3-1 to move on against the Saboteurs who are probably just double-checking this game a bit to see who's picking what. Yeah, there's another combo. Again, he keeps hitting them, and this time the follow-up is there. So they do get the kill on Phoenix. Renella is trying to get away from it, and I'm not so sure if he can. Alarak is already waiting for the next combo. He's trying to get the hit, and there's the stun. They get two kills. Karazim and Phoenix are gone, and guys, Team Ash is struggling here. They are. They have the Vikings, of course, and that is the advantage on the macro level. But everything else is starting to become a problem, because this is now the third time that Arthas has died, so he's having a tough time. And this is just not looking all that good for Team Ash. It's looking very good for the Enjoyers. So, yeah. At the bottom of the map, we got Bishops doing his thing against the camp. They sniff him out as well. So, Ether has now been scouted out too, but they know what's happening and they can just invade and everybody is already on their way. The Tong connects, but here comes Phoenix. Uh, the camp is still not stolen, wow. Misha moving in, but now they're focusing on Rexa. Ana is a little bit too late, but they're still about to take the camp here. Rexa is down, but what about the camp? Bishops falls, Phoenix! Oh, it's a slaughter! It's an absolute slaughter down here. Yeah, well, as it turns out, it is indeed the team in blue that is able to finally pick off a couple of heroes, and they take the camp too. So, yeah, first Rexar fell, and then down here, it was just, yeah, just damage galore. As everybody went for it. Alarak, the Haka, they both died. 
By now we have level 10 abilities, and as per our usual agreement with Arthurs in these games here at Meta Madness, we have Syndragosa. Yep, Syndragosa is in, and on top of that, we now have also last rights. We got the seven-sided strike, and we got the boars. Every single time that I see Rexa these days, I'm just reminded of the... Like, there's so many nice little small towns that are in the area here around Valencia. And whenever we're on our bike rides on uh, the weekend, we're always stopping for, uh, yeah, just like, you know, a coffee and a little bit of food. And they always have, like, like fresh boar meat. I mean, it's honestly amazing. It's incredible. And that's what I have to think about every time I see this. Nice attempt to get a kill on Ana with last rides, by the way, but it didn't work. They got the kill eventually, but there's no stack. They still get the three kills on the other hand. <laughs> then they make it four. <laughs> They make it five, guys, five, man, team, wipe. They only had to sacrifice Arthurs for it, but that was a massive, of course. What a huge fight there. I mean, check this battle out. Anna initially surviving, then she gets killed too by Karazim, as Baldi comes in and just punches them out quickly. Nine kills to seven now, so they've taken the lead on it. And yeah, they're looking great here. They struggled so much at the beginning of the game, but now they are two levels ahead. They've pulled that in kills. They're taking the fort at the bottom of the map. They want the seed here too. They have to, of course, deny it to the red team, or it's going to be ter garden terrors for the enjoyers. But yeah, that was pretty bonkers. Huge plays being made right now. And Team Ash is recovering their momentum and getting their spot in the game. Look at Anna. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Anna is trying to save Jaina. The ice block from Alvaro's saving him here. The fort at the bottom of the map, by the way, has now fallen. And with both teams now on two seats, which this means the next one is going to determine which team gets the Garden Terrors. So, yeah. Another attempt to go for a Baylock here, at least. But Dehaka. He's going to be needed on that seed fight in just a second, as the teams are again trying to make their plays. The problem for the red team is simply they don't have level 13, so if they're forced into a fight without their level 13 talent, that would be highly uncomfortable for them. And I think this is likely what's going to happen. They're trying to get the experience at the bottom and in the middle now, so this is another wave that they can get, and I guess they're going to have the time to catch up with this. But there's the Garden Terrors. Yeah, with the help of the Vikings, they can easily lock them in. That small window, guys, what kind of window is this? This is like 10 seconds, maybe 20, and that was more than enough for them to get the Garden Terrors. Nano boost on Anna, uh, on, on Jaina, Anna with her ult here, but Garden Terrors already down at the bottom of the map, and here in the middle as they're going for not only another kill, but also Fort that they're trying to destroy. At the top lane, we have another set of Garden Terrors too, and down here at the bottom of the map, the keep is about to get attacked. So, big, big plays made by Team Ash as they are just drilling the momentum. We have the Enjoyers losing more and more ground with every single second. Down at the bottom of the map, the wall is already partially opened up. They're trying to do the same thing here in the middle as the first few heroes are starting to rotate towards the top lane, attempting, of course, to take all of those forts out. Not so sure that they can get all of them here, but still. Vikings, by the way, with 30 stacks now on the Viking Horde, so they are getting some decent regeneration as well. And, well, there we go. Lopaka gets attacked. Olaf is out. And they are abandoning the fort at the top lane. So, nicely done. Okay. 16 is in. 10 kills, 2-8. And... I mean, again, it's just getting worse and worse and worse for the Enjoyers. It really is. They're trailing behind with the talent time and time again. And all the forts are now gone. There's a two-level gap. So for two levels, there will be a talent advantage for Team Ash and a significant one at that. And not only is that a problem, but large and in charge in and of itself is an issue. Even if you have the same talents. So is Cleansing Touch. So, those are some pretty big upgrades on level 16 for the team. But, yeah. This is going to get real dangerous. Maybe if Alarak pops off with good sadism stacks, he could definitely do that. Currently, we have him on 22,000 damage. It's still Jaina that ro is rocking the numbers for the red team with 35k. Way ahead of anybody on the blue team side, by the way. Just look at this. Phoenix is the highest one, and he's only sitting at 21,000. Then you have uh, behind him, Malthael. They don't really have a lot of numbers. So, yeah, cams are getting attacked again. 
enjoyers they're giving up a lot of ground because they're just not willing to go up against an opponent and has a level 16 talent advantage over them and who can blame them honestly so yeah, nobody really but yeah next seed is up that is by the way the big thing still for the red team that they have two seeds so if they just can get level 16 and then win a fight over an objective they will get garden terrors and that should help them a lot here so far that hasn't really happened. There's another quick move being made with Syndragosa as they're trying for the bottom keep. They're attempting to use that small window of opportunity that they still have with this. Yeah. At the top, the Vikings are pushing this out too. So we have Vikings pushing in the middle at the top with Siege Giant Camps and Catapults and they're gonna get damage in. They're not gonna destroy a keep here, but they opened this wall up a little bit further. Level 16 is now finally available for the enjoyers as well. And down at the bottom of the map, eh, I guess the keep has taken some damage, but obviously not enough to make a difference. Oh, nice. <laughs> but Lopaka still gets away. And that is some nice heal here as well, obviously. So, yep, really good self-heal on the Vikings now. 43 stacks on the baseline quest on the Viking Horde. And, I mean, as all of this continues, they are going to dominate those lanes even further. More camps are about to be claimed. They're even uh, double-checking if there's somebody lurking in the bushes here. Baylock at the bottom of the map. And all the way up at the top. Party continues here, too. So, just as the seed appears on the map, this is one that they could likely let go. And, well, let's see. Uh, they're trying to interrupt, of course, still. And the attack is still coming up at the top. Syndra goes as ready in 10 seconds. They could use her here. But Jaina's now also on the way. Jaina's on the way. Syndra goes as available in 2 seconds. If they want to go for it, which they could. Haven't made a play for this yet. Uh, three heroes attacking, but the defense is obviously now coming through too. Channel attempt this time. A Malthael down at the bottom of the map. Obviously, this is all heavily split now. And level 20 is so incredibly close for Team Ash that they're just trying to delay them for as long as they can so they can use their level 20 advantage. And Marcel is moving in. Here comes Phoenix. Says hello with an ult. And that is a kill and a stack for Marcel as they take Anna down. Syndragosa flying off as level 20 hits. Rexa is dead. Marcel is also killed but can buy back of course. And on top of that we now have on 20 the anti-magic shell and here's the opportunity for team ash to get some keeps and maybe even the game and the minimum that you want to do right now is take a keep down your opponent has only two defenders only jaina and the haka are left so that's a huge opportunity to make exactly that play and they're coming in with that as is so yep yeah, very nicely done they're taking the keep down at the bottom of the map and in the meantime, of course, we're having in the middle the next push. They could take all of them right now. It's taking another 10 seconds for Alarak to be back, and he is still going to be a threat for them. But on a macro level, they are heavily winning now. Actually, as is, it seems that they're not even going to get a second keep, which is kind of surprising to me. There's catapults on the core now, but we're only 14 minutes in, so yeah, they had a chance to go to the top lane, decided not to. Here come the boars now, seven-sided strike, gets unleashed, but Karazim still dies. Yeah, Karazim still falls, and we have the top lane, of course, pushed back. So essentially, the red team is still pinned down in their base, and the problem of them running up against uh, an opponent with a talent advantage still persists. This time it's just not the level 16 talent, it's the level 20 talent. So the situation isn't really getting any better for them. It's just being shifted. Yeah, nice attempt to uh, steal the camp. They will be able to do that. But Malthil is doing the same thing over on the right side. So yeah, he's claiming this. And up at the top we got Lopaka still going for Slingshot Boy. And trying to push that keep further. Which he is going to be able to do with this. Now it's not going to take a massive amount of damage. But there, every little bit counts. And the Haka just can't keep up with it. The red team has at least stolen the camp over here. Another seat is spawning. And this time no matter who takes it. It will be the third one. And there will be garden terrors. And of course once that team Ash is grabbing that thing. It's likely game. If the enjoyers get it. Then at least they have a chance to bring it back. The Haka is chasing Eric away from the top lane. That top side keep has nearly fallen. Olaf is pushing in the middle. And they're even going for a camp at the bottom of the map. While everybody else is trying to prevent the seed from being gathered. So, yeah. Lopaka still has to take this. 
You still gotta take it, bro. Not sure what to tell you here. So, yeah, it's nice that you guys went for it, but you still have to claim the camp, which he does right now. Interrupt happened again, and now their siege shines at the bottom of the map and catapults, which of course means that it's going to push straight for the core. Level 20 on both sides, which gives us the hasty bargain. We got the kill command and the nano infusion, but these interrupts, they are happening and happening and happening, and they're just doing their thing. And time is working in favor of Team Ash, because right now, this is barreling through the bot lane, and it will force somebody back, and guess what? In the middle, the situation is not all that much better, because here are Ah, the Vikings. Now they're getting caught though. I mean, that's what's ever to happen eventually. And Arthurs gets nearly insta-killed, but he survives. And Ana instead gets destroyed, but so does Karazim. Arthurs is there too. Core is getting attacked through the bottom of the map as all of this is starting to happen. But it is a four versus three now. Vikings are doing their best. The core is starting to lose hit points in a moment, and even Phoenix is moving in as they are trying to end the game here. Core is losing hit points quickly, and Phoenix is just shelling away against it. The fight over the seed still raging on as it would drop Garden Terrors, but the core is down to 55%. Malthael is dead, and this time he can't buy back, but just look at that core. 31%. He has gone for the Unconquered Spirit, but I don't think he can do the entire thing alone, can he now? He's trying to. That catapult's a problem. That catapult is a huge problem. 15% and Moreda's is likely gonna die. He's gonna die. <laughs> 3% on the core! 3% as the Vikings are still interrupting! Phoenix was so close! Catapults in the middle, damage against the keeps potentially, another big wave up at the top as we're just seeing attack after attack coming. Jaina cannot take the camp, it's 3 versus 3 on the map now, if you count the Vikings, which you always should. As down at the bottom of the map, the next catapult is going to start pushing in. This time they go for Eric, they take him down, but there's still a few Vikings back to business. They can interrupt here once more. They're going to delay it just slightly, and there it is. Jaina interrupted. Renella is going to be fine for now. They know also perfectly where Ana is, of course. And they're not interrupting. They're not interrupting! Garden Terrors for the red team! Garden Terrors for the Enjoyers as they're still defending down at the bottom of the map. But guess what? The keep at the top has now been lost. So there's kind of pulls going to be happening on every, I mean, with every wave now. It is tough. With three points on the core, you're not in a good spot. <laughs> Even with Garden Terrors to your name, you're not in a good spot with this. Yeah, that's just going to be insanely difficult for the Enjoyers to bring back. They're going to try though. They're gonna try it through the middle, I suppose, and they kill Maltail, but he buys back. So Maltail is back to business. The problem is really that they have to go through these forts as well. It's not only the keeps that they gotta destroy if they wanna go for the core, they have to destroy forts, they haven't done anything here. So Arthur's is coming in again. There's already the salvo as they're flanking. I'm actually not sure why they're so aggressive around this, but no way! Ana survives! Then again, Jaina, seven-sided strike, Alvaro, and he's gone. Phoenix is warping out, unconquered spirit, keeping him alive, and they get the kill against the Haka. This seems to be the end of the game. Now that they've lost not only Jaina, but also the Haka, this is a problem. Yeah, they go for Rexa, and he's not gonna survive this. He's feigning him de his death for a second. At least they're getting a kill against Arthurs again. Yeah, Arthurs has done a lot of dying in this game. He died six times, but this is obviously still an issue. Now, the fort at the top, still in play. Fort at the bottom of the map, yeah, should actually make it. Once that the seat is gone, yeah, so they should be able to keep both of their forts. Barely. Even if they can't end the game here, they would still have a massive amount of catapults on all the lanes. 62,000 damage, by the way, from Malthael, and 74,000 from Jaina. But the attacks, they keep coming. Last rites and get wrecked. Seven sided and goodbye. That's a full five-man wipe now, and this is game. A 3-1 victory, ladies and gentlemen, for Team Ash as they take the Enjoyers down and move on to the Losers Bracket Final, where they will face off against the Saboteurs.
Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.